May the Lord Jesus give you his peace. We remember in a special way today, in addition to the intention of the Holy Mass, the victims of 9-11, and entrusting at this road of Mass of St. Joseph their salvation to his paternal care. We um, are given the real beatitude with our Lord here in Luke 6, and he gives us four beatitudes, which some authors will attribute to the four cardinal virtues. And looking at this first one, blessed are the poor, are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And we kind of pause and uh, think of the great gift that we've been given with the Marian vow as, in this point of history, as the real cum culmination of St. Francis's take on poverty. And St. Therese can help us to really kind of understand this, uh, being kind of the soul to whom the Lord deigned to expound this mystery in the interior. So here's a, a few things. First off, if we start with St. Francis in poverty, we look to his rule, chapter 6, where he gives us basically the, the real marrow of the charism. The brothers shall not appropriate to themselves anything at all, uh, neither a house nor a place nor anything at all. And that word appropriation really gets at his take on the fallenness of human nature because not only these temporal goods, but also the internal goods of the soul are subject to this uh, concupiscence. He writes this, uh, the greatest enemy of man is his flesh. This is second Chilano, but the, the words of St. Francis to his brothers, the greatest enemy of man is his flesh. It's not the world. It's not the devil. It's the interior enemy, according to St. Francis. It claims as its own, it transfers to its own glory what was not given to it, but to the soul. It seeks for praise for its virtues and the external favor of men for its watchings and prayers. It leaves nothing to the soul, but seeks a reward even for its tears. So this is the problem, so to speak, and this is why um, poverty was the privilege route, St. Clair, right, the privilege of poverty, to address that. And again, the blessing that we've received this day as the Marian vow is the very culmination of this vow of poverty, or really the soul of the vow of poverty, as it is the soul for all the evangelical councils, of addressing this problem in its deepest sense. Because with the Marian vow and with Marian consecration, we divest ourselves of these interior goods. They're called merits and satisfactions. Here's also St. Um, Thomas Aquinas. He talks about a certain good of the soul which drives its aspect of appetibility, this kind of concupiscence, merely through being apprehended, right? Being perceived, and not only by others, but by oneself as well, taking stock of the goods of the soul and apprehending them. And then this self-complacency can kind of creep in, uh, and this is vainglory. So uh, St. Francis is addressing this with the gift of poverty. He says, blessed is the servant who stores up in heaven. Remember the scripture? Um, Store up for yourselves riches in heaven. Uh, the good which the Lord reveals to him and does not wish to reveal them to others under the guise for reward. So this is kind of what we're talking about, the interior appropriation of these spiritual goods and how the Marian vow will address this. And it's true because where our treasure is, uh, there also will our hearts be. And if our treasure, which the interior treasure is, with the Immaculate Virgin Mary, then also our hearts are in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So looking at these, and neither St. Therese, well, St. Therese did mention in her act of oblation uh, merit. Uh, St. Francis didn't, but his thought was basically laying the groundwork for what we're looking at. Uh, the merits and satisfactions. Merit, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, refers to the value of an act which makes it worthy of reward. It can't be done without the merits of Jesus Christ, which are infinite and of working through the soul, and our contribution is basically a consent to grace. Merits, according to St. Louis de Montfort, are incommunicable. In other words, we can't give them to others. They are and will be our life of glory in heaven. Uh, so their entrustment or safekeeping with our heavenly queen is sometimes in you might have read uh, St. Faustina's autobiography, and she actually transcribed part of this little book called um, A Catechism of the Vows by a, a Father Cotel, a Jesuit. It was very, very, very good. And on, in speaking of the vow of poverty, he'll talk about proprietorship. Remember that word appropriation, making one things one's own. And poverty addresses proprietorship in both two senses. One, the right 
I have no right of taking the vow of poverty to appropriate these things as my own property. And also the act. And now with these categories that we're looking at with merits and satisfactions, we also renounce the right to proprietorship. And that seems to involve merits that I have no right. I've given that right over to the Blessed Virgin Mary, that she uh, is in charge of their safekeeping. And in this way, perhaps we can think that we become the property of the Immaculate. It's the St. Maximilian's take on Marian consecration. I'm not, and the scripture says, you are not your own. And here in a special way, we are not our own, but we are our ladies. Okay. Uh, satisfaction is the second category. And St. Louis de Montfort says that those are communicable. We can, so to speak, give those, bestow those, intercede for others, uh, our charity, our, 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 our life of charity. For example, you take up a fast, right? and you, you fast for a specific thing. Uh, Pope Francis asked us to fast last Saturday uh, as first Saturday for peace, and we did. And with Marian consecration, this is the act of proprietorship. Those things which are ostensibly ours, we can dispossess ourselves of. We can give them to whom we wish. In Marian consecration, we don't, or at least we give that prerogative over to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Insofar as we do that, we can kind of see how we can become uh, slaves radically of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is an extremely scriptural term. Uh, Jesus is described by St. Paul as a slave, right? Taking the form of a slave in Philippians. Mother Mary in, her, in the Annunciation is the handmaid of the slave of the Lord. Lots of the letters of St. Paul's and the Catholic epistles will result with the, the apostle of the apostles saying that I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. So there's nothing here that's contrary to human dignity and very much uh, on the other hand it's really the realization of it okay so to saint therese uh, what does she have to teach us well she has a lot to teach us about this absolute poverty and it kind of gets around a few different aspects one is that we can say in her spirituality she has this kind of absolute kenosis this absolute pouring out she'll talk about how um you know, in all the years of her Carmel, she hasn't had a, a moment to work for herself because anything good uh, coming into the soul, so to speak, which is just merits and satisfactions, she immediately gives over for the salvation of souls. Remember, she's the patron of missionaries, never left the convent, but at the same time, grace being spread, continuing to be spread throughout the world because of her oblation. And this is this radical kenosis. And we also get plugged into this also because of that, there's a radical hiddenness. And this also is very much mirrors the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, true devotion. The first opening paragraphs, that's what St. Louis de Montfort focuses on. How Our Lady is hidden, how Our Lord favored Our Lady's humility by hiding her from all creatures and from herself. So again, that's what we're kind of looking at with Marian consecration, how the Lord will be pleased to set up this obscurity within the soul so that kind of separating ourselves and this kind of stance of self-complacency uh, should be very much mitigated, should not be the overriding tendency of the soul. Um, so this hiddenness, she says, you know, um, I've been in the Carmel for, I don't know, nine years, and I should be very much more advanced than why I am. Um, and she compares herself to her you know, the, the great generosity of her sisters, and she's an aunt, basically, just very, very slow progress, at least in her eyes, but because of this oblation that she's made. And next, and perhaps the, the crux of it, is this littleness and nothingness that um, she'll talk about, and if I can um, just cite her specifically, because it's very, very beautiful. The thing that pleases our Lord is that I love my littleness and poverty and have a blind hope in his mercy. And she's writing to her sister. Oh, my beloved sister, understand well that in order to love Jesus and be his victim of love, the weaker we are and the more completely without desires or virtues, the more we shall be disposed to receive the benefits of his consuming and transforming love working within us. It is enough to have the one desire of being a victim, provided we are content to remain always poor and powerless. To consent to remain always poor and powerless, there lies the difficulty. So this two aspect. Absolute poverty and absolute powerlessness. Actually, where can we find one who is truly poor? Is he not alone truly poor who is so humble-minded that he believes himself to be nothing? 
Oh, let us then remain far away from all that is vainglorious. Let us love our littleness and our lack of sensitivity. We shall then be poor in spirit, and Jesus will come for us, however far we may be from him, and will set us afire with his love. Remember, the goal of Marian vow is seraphic love. This double consent of radical poverty, radical powerlessness will spark that. How I wish that I could make you understand what I feel. It is confidence and confidence alone that should lead us to love. Okay, so this is the, in, the, uh, the little way of St. Therese and has everything to do with the Marian vow. This absolute littleness really is turned over into this absolute confidence because there's no, there's no recourse to anybody else. Not men, not myself for sure, but only to Jesus. And so consciousness of having no merits, this spiritual poverty becomes a real source of wealth and power in the uh, eyes of St. Therese, and so it should be for us as well. Uh, as we, in the day before the Holy Name of Mary feast, uh, relying more and more on invoking and really being divested of, and perhaps a good spiritual exercise today, an examination of conscience, how we can grow in self-complacency. Although we have given everything over, we still have that interior drag of standing back and looking at the self and taking stock of one's goods. So that splinter or perhaps beam can be removed.